Thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Please send in your questions each and every week and we'll explore the history of the city of Mississauga together. Like, subscribe and follow us and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Joining us this week for Ask a Historian is once again, our special guest, Richard Collins, local historian, museum interpreter, researcher, uh, past president of the Mississauga South Historical Society. I can go on and on. And uh, Richard, I know you've got uh, ties both here at home in Mississauga and from your time in Ottawa and you're, you're, you, you're connected to a number of historical, of, of heritage organizations. But uh, thank you for joining us and for lending your expertise and uh, frankly, your strange passions on, on uh, things, that, things that run on rails for this week. I love trains. <laughs> I don't know why I just do. Um, so we, for this week's episode, we have a number of, of, of uh, rail themed questions that have come in and we brought Richard on to uh, kind of explore some of those topics with us, uh, given his extensive knowledge on, uh, on, on things that run on rails in historic Mississauga. So thank you, Diane, for your question. And uh, we're looking at the old streetcar line that went through Cooksville and Meadowvale. Uh, and uh, we know it as, uh, as uh, the Radial Railway, but uh, it has a, has a more official name and uh, a kind, of, kind of a colorful history. And the question is, you know, where did it go? But uh, perhaps maybe we can step back first and uh, what was it and how did it come to be? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, where did it go was nowhere. <laughs> uh, that's part of the problem. It was called the Toronto Suburban Railway. Uh, and it was a radial railway. Radial is a very Canadian term. Uh, you don't use that much in the U.S. and in Britain. But it meant uh, electric railway lines rather than steam-powered trains. And they were called that because the earliest ones in Hamilton radiated east, west, and south of the city, and then a line north to Mobile, which almost made it to Mississauga, but not quite. And then later, there were some radial railways that radiated west, north, and east out of Toronto. And one of those that headed east out of Toronto was the Toronto Suburban bound for Guelph, and it made it there, it made it to Cooksville in 1915, made it to Streetsville later on in 1915, finally got to Guelph in 1917, and they just ran trolleys, like yeah, single cars that were powered by, there'd be an overhead trolley pole, that's what you call them, trolleys, uh, that would connect, uh, that would gather electric power from overhead power lines, kind of like transmission lines. And uh, yeah, so that ran from 1915 till 1931. So it's around 14 years, 15 years. Uh, and it was mostly because it went nowhere. It didn't, it came close to Cooksville, uh, about where Square One is now. So if the Toronto Suburban were around today, it would be like a, a really important go transit line because <laughs> it goes behind what was Square One and goes through some uh, heavy uh, populated areas. But at the time when Mississauga was all farmland, its nearest stop close to Streetsville was a good two miles east of Streetsville. So it was useless for them. Uh, say well north of Cooksville at the time, Square One's busy now, but the village of Cooksville was way farther south. Uh, it went through Meadowvale and Churchville, uh, so they could use the service. But for the most part, it didn't go near anyone. Uh, so it didn't get a lot of traffic. I know I know one of the, uh, the famous pictures we have, and we'll, we'll show it, is... Uh, uh, a bunch of people in their Sunday finest at the Cooksville train station, and uh, uh, it, it uh, always puzzled of, of you know what there was no train in the picture, but it appears that they're waiting for the radial railway uh, and probably on their way to uh, the famed El Dorado Park up in what is now Brampton. Yeah, um, that was owned by the railway. Yeah, that was oftentimes what they would do to get, and that's why I would typically on a Sunday, which was a quiet day, because they would get commuters from Cooksville going into Toronto during the day, although they couldn't get right into Toronto, they would only get to a boat. Keel and Dundas, and then they had to take uh, city street cars. So it would take forever to get downtown. But on a Sunday, yeah, you'd go in the opposite direction. You'd go to El Dorado Park, which was owned by the railway, and that encouraged people. And then the, the rides were powered by electricity. Most people didn't have electricity then. Few of the things that ran off electricity were radio trains and roller coasters. Right. <laughs> and, and I guess to kind of to set the scene for it as well, I mean, you, you mentioned they, they were kind of single car uh, trolleys that were uh, ran on overhead electrical wire 
um, and uh, they were, but they were designed for commuter uh, transport, right? Like th this was uh, to take people from the the hinterland into into the city uh, during the week. Uh, yeah, most of the other railways that around did that. I mean, the other railway line that ran through uh, Lakeview and Port Credit, uh, the Toronto uh, and York radio. Yeah, same idea. Run along the lake shore, get people into Toronto, or in some cases. Uh, uh, later on was converted to buses, it took a lot of Toronto and Tobacco people, people out to the uh, refinery in Toronto. So yeah. sometimes it was actually bringing people out to Mississauga for work. But yeah, usually it was busy in the mornings and evenings, and there were more trains, like rush hour trains at the time. Right. And they would run every 20 minutes or so, which is about the same as the gold train service today. So they began in 1915 with yeah. service, and they closed, when did you say they closed? 1931. 1931. And yeah, basically it was a 15-year charter, uh, and when the 15 years was up, <laughs> they applied uh, to cancel the service because they weren't making any money, but the charter was, forced them to stay in business. I, I was going to ask, though, what, what, what caused the demise? Was it simply lack of use, or? Yeah, lack of use, no traffic, uh, very few people using it, uh, and not a lot of car competition at the time. Some right. people had cars, but man, during the Depression, of course, it closed down the early part of the Depression. When even then you lost a lot of your commuter traffic, a lot of people lost their jobs. Yeah. 29, 30, 31. So there were even fewer people to carry. Uh, so yeah, it just, it, it, it never made any money. And while radios could be profitable if they were busy, uh, they were, if they weren't busy, there wasn't enough money to pay for maintaining the tracks, uh, maintaining and repairing the trolley cars. Uh, paying a lot of taxes when you think about paying think about what you're paying property taxes on your property you yeah. have a railway paying property taxes for miles and miles and miles of railway tracks it really adds up and so a lot of companies just found that they couldn't make any money. I, I, it probably would have been gone by the late 30s into the 40s anyways because by everyone's got cars so uh, right one takes takes street cars now the the the, uh, the thing that I find uh, you know history has a sense of humor sometimes you know here we are uh, in the midst of if you ever gone up here on Hero Street lately you know the LRT mm -hmm. construction is well underway and and uh, we'll introduce a new method of transportation uh, in in our in our city's network um, but you know here we were uh, you know ninety years earlier seventy years earlier whatever the math is there in the nineteen twenties and ending in nineteen thirty one we had a dedicated transport line as you mentioned that would have been you know, really well patronized today. Yeah, um, and yet uh, that that line is all but gone on our landscape today. That that original line, because in a sense they gave the land back when they tore up the tracks. They simply a lot of it was repurchased by farmers. Yep. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, they were given the first right to buy the land back. So yeah, oddly enough, we're still in a time period of Mississauga's history uh, when the, the radio line closed down. It went back to be farmland. Yeah. To that there are some places where uh, uh because it was taken over by ontario hydro uh as a lot of the railways were just before it went bankrupt they're the ones that actually shut it down and they wanted it mostly for the right of way so for the transmission towers they didn't want the trains right in one of the towers and so there are sections uh uh on the burnham thorpe just east of here, Ontario, I can't remember the, but before you get to Central Parkway uh, on Burnham Park Beast, you can still see a bit of a path that goes along a branch of the, uh, of the Cooksville Creek. And you can still see a bit of right of way, which is about the same width as what the, uh, the trains would have been. And there's still transmission lines, the uh, telephone poles essentially, yeah. that are still there. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's been it's been wiped out by uh, the modern streets with all their sort of squiggly yeah. cul-de-sacs and stuff, which yeah, pay no regard to the old right of way. Yeah, there, there's some there's some ghosts out there. I know the the old radio bridge abutments in Meadowville are still there, and yeah. uh, but but you're right. I mean, the line itself has has almost essentially disappeared on the landscape today, and yet. You know, for a period of time, there was this ambitious project to uh, to, to bring suburban public transportation, electrical uh, public trans transportation through this area, albeit yeah. uh, 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 90 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And if you wanted to take it, you could take it to Georgetown and yeah. Guelph, Acton, 
all sorts of big metropolitans along the way. So it was known as the Toronto Suburban Railway between 1915 and 1931, an electric uh, trolley car service that ran through historic Mississauga. So fasc fascinating chapter of our story. And thank you, Diane, for your question. So next question is from Terry. And uh, it's one that, uh, that I always say, if, if we talk railways, there's one name in the history that brings up a sense of romance to me. This, this idea of this, this grand gilded age of railway travel. And, and, and I don't know that it's, it's really a, a true representation of it, but when you hear the term grand trunk, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it echoes back to you know, this, this era before modern transportation and when, when railways and people dressed up in their finest and, and, and went on these excursions. I don't know that it's an accurate depiction of what actually transpired, but, but the, the Grand Trunk Railway uh, came through Malton in the 1850s, 1854, 1853-54 uh, is that the tracks were laid. And Terry's question is, uh, what's the story of the Grand Trunk through Malton? Uh, and it's a very, sh the, the, the section of the Grand Trunk that comes through Mississauga is about the shortest railway section to intersect Mississauga because it only yeah, goes just, through a very short corner, corner of Mississauga. <laughs> but of course, it's, it's part of a much broader network, uh, railway network. So Richard, I'm wondering if you can just, you know, touch on the story of, you know, this famed word, the Grand Trunk. Um, well, the Grand Trunk was grand. It really was at one point. It was Canada's busiest railway. It was the railway that linked Montreal to Toronto in 1854. So it did link Canada's two biggest cities. And, uh, yeah, there weren't a lot of railways in Canada. There was nothing nearly quite that long. Uh, yeah, so it was, and it was financed with British money, so... Uh, they tend to like use the word grand or great in the name of their railways. And it was a marketing scheme or anything. But it was a, a grand railway and it was a trunk railway uh, in the sense that uh, the government was giving money to any railways that would build trunk lines that would connect the major cities. And as long as that could be defined as a trunk line, uh, then you could get government grants uh, to help build the line, which uh, the developers of the grand trunk did. They were looking for government money wherever they could get it. So they built between Montreal and Toronto, got to Toronto 1854. Uh, the line didn't get to, to Malton until 1856. Okay. So yeah, the Grand Trunks, 80, or 1854 is right as far as the railway being completed in Toronto. But then they wanted to build to Sarnia, originally to Detroit, but they realized uh, the, the ferry service was gonna be easier between Sarnia and Port Huron than between Windsor and Detroit. So. Uh, they purchased the charter of a, a little railway called the Toronto and Guelph uh, and then bought that out. It was a charter, which means it never built itself the uh, uh, Grand Trunk uh, Board of Directors. They purchased the sign and they completed it through Malton in uh, July. Well, the grand opening was July 1st, 1856. And it wasn't Canada back then because there was no Canada yet. So it wasn't picked July 1st to be a... <laughs> to be a uh, Canada Day thing. It was just happened to be the first day of the month of 1856, and they had a grand opening ceremony for all the stops along the way, including, yeah, a stop in Malton, just at that little corner of the city. And yeah, that's the Grand Trunk. And uh, it, it uh, stayed a fairly powerful, influential railway until it started losing money in the 1920s because it grew too big too fast, started buying up a bunch of, of other less profitable railways. And then in 1923, it was merged into a couple of other railways that had already become Canadian national. And that's why you see CN up there now. I was going to say, it's a, that, that line, which is still, I always tell people, it's, it's it runs on the same right of way. It doesn't mean it's the actual same uh, railway. They, they certainly upgraded the, uh, the infrastructure over time. But uh, the right of way is what was established really at the formation of Malton itself. And... Uh, I, I love the fact that you know the old Malton town site is oriented to the railway and not the uh, not the road network, and so you have like this railway town in a sense that was laid out around the railway, the highest order of transportation at that time. And so, 1856, uh, July 1st, you said we had the the grand opening of the uh, the Grand Trunk through Malton, and uh, um, re really helped shape the identity of that community for uh, for a, a generation or more. And uh, uh, it's still there. It still defines the the streetscape of that community. The crossing of the railway is, is uh, the old downtown core of the original town site of Malton. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before you mentioned. Yeah, you think of uh, Port Credit and Streetsville are centered around the river because yeah. the river was the main source of transportation or for power. 
and all that. Yeah, and Cooksville was the intersection of two uh, roadways at the time. Yeah, Malton is that one case where the town center is defined where the grand truck said we're putting the station here and they laid out the town and the business the downtown area was located where the railway said we're putting our station and that's typical of a lot of towns uh especially when you get up to western canada the railway was there first and the town grew up around the railway uh but except in the case of Malton, yeah some of the other towns are older than the railways they go back to the waterways now uh, you, you picture you know Malton at that point is kind of a uh, when, when the railway is formed is really a service village for the surrounding rural countryside. Um, the railway, although designed to transport people and goods, you can see really from Malton, it's probably transporting materials more than people uh, that are going to, you know, where are they going? Are they going to Toronto? Or are they going the other direction? Where, what, what would you, do we have an idea where that draw, of, say the local people using the Grand Trunk would be and what they were bringing? Uh, at the time, it's hard to say. It was mostly getting people, first of all, it brought in a lot of settlers. So mm -hmm. it was important for that. But once they moved in, they didn't need the train as much. Except the train still brought in supplies. This is a time when uh, people heated their house with coal. So the coal had to come in by train. Uh, any kind of goods that were brought to the general stores, any kind of food and uh, uh, meat and milk and things like this, this all came in by rail. Uh, at the time, was, think, think of what comes in on delivery trucks and uh, nowadays is what the railways were carrying at the time. They were vital uh, for a town's survival. And then I see people uh, later on, they would use them if they had to commute into Toronto. Certainly, that's uh, the, the Malton Go station is a busy train station now. It's for people to get on the train. Yeah. Uh, depending on jobs in Toronto in the morning. Uh, but it's also that section of lines busy for freight because if you look at Mississauga, you see all these warehouses. It's a very busy industrial part of Mississauga. And uh, the busy freight line through there is, uh, yeah, you constantly see, you know, 100 car long freight trains now. Yeah. And uh, certainly a little bit more of an infrastructure and, you know, the trains would have been much longer than the, than what we had talked about previously with the Toronto Suburban. Uh, I mean, this was a proper uh, uh, heavy gauge railway uh, that ran through, uh, ran through Malton. Oh yeah. It was a, it was a full size steam railway. And as yeah. the trains got bigger in general across North America, yeah, the trains going through Malton got bigger steam and then finally diesel and then maybe electric someday. Right. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, like I said, the, the name Grand Trunk uh, harkens back kind of this romantic image of the, the gilded age of railway transport, if that was, uh, if that's a proper way to put it. And uh, certainly there's some books you can read out there on, on the Grand Trunk Railway and its history. Um, so the, uh, for, for that, uh, thank you for, for sharing your knowledge. And Terry, thank you for, for asking the question. Our third question is from Steve, and uh, he's wondering about a, a mystery, a, perhaps a childhood mystery from Streetsville, and uh, wondering about the, the junction of, of two railways, and uh, where did one of them go? I guess, as he, as he mentioned, walking the uh, railways as a, as a kid, maybe he only went one direction. He didn't follow the other one. So uh, north, of, uh, north of Britannia Road in Streetsville, uh, the, uh, what was the Credit Valley Railway Line, splits into two um, and one of them continues uh, westward and uh, and beyond out of Mississauga but the other one uh, crosses uh, uh, Queen Street what is Mississauga Road and continues up northwards and his question is uh, uh, you know I guess the, the history of that line we know it is uh, originally the Credit Valley Railway line um, but that junction and where where does it go? Yeah both lines were Credit Valley I've heard some people say because it, it looks like two railway lines converge was it two different railways that happened to meet at what's called Streetsville Junction. But no, it was a main line, the Credit Valley Railway ran from Toronto. Uh, initially, the original main line went to St. Thomas, south of London, with a connection to an American railway that was taking a shortcut between Buffalo and Detroit to Southern Ontario, because it was faster than going into Lake Erie, uh, the New York Central. And Canadian Pacific decided they would rather have an interchange with the New York Central rather than having to change with the Grand Trunk, because the Grand Trunk was the big competition. And so they built their main line between Toronto, up through Streetsville, uh, and then through Milton, down through uh, Galt, and uh, into London and St. Thomas. But they built a branch around the same time. Uh, both lines were completed in 1879, at just, yeah, just at Britannia Road, where a branch came off uh, for Orangeville. 
I'm not too sure why. There's not a lot of, I guess it was just to get to the few industries that were in Orangeville. Orangeville didn't have any other railway service at the time, so the Credit Valley Railway thought, well, we'll build there and be the first railway in town. And so it runs through uh, uh, Alton and Cataract, forks of the Credit Little, well, through Branton and Snell Grove. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's where that splits off at Streetsville Junction. And How far did the, two it, it, the terminus was Orangeville, or did it go further? The terminus for the uh, Credit Valley was uh, initially Orangeville, uh, and then a few years later, the Credit Valley Railway was bought by Canadian Pacific, which is why you see the CP trains going through there now. But they also bought another railway that went from Toronto to Owen Sound, but also by way of Orangeville, they bought both railways, and then eventually extended the trains. Uh, once it got to Orangeville, they just switched over to the tracks of what was called the Toronto Gray and Bruce Railway. Yeah. And so the trains that were going through uh, streets so right up to the 1970s, uh, the ones that stayed right, they veered right onto the Y, crossed Mississauga Road and continued, ended up in Orangeville. And then finally the trains terminated every day at Owen Sound. Right. That's the end of the line. Whereas the trains that veered west uh, from Streetsville Junction, as the GO trains still do nowadays, those are the ones that bound. Uh, for London and St. Thomas, right. and today the go trains daily uh, go as far as Milton. And then that uh, that nor the original North Line that went to Orangeville, part of it is still uh, in um, in service. I guess uh, that's where the Credit Valley Explorer runs uh, mm -hmm. out of. Uh, Both of them are still in operation. The one that goes west, the go trains use that's still Canadian Pacific's main line. Yeah, that's why you see a lot of big trains going through streets. So that's their basically their Montreal, Toronto, Detroit, Chicago. Right. A very busy uh, continental main line. Uh, yeah, the, uh, but the one that goes through uh, Orangeville, uh, Canadian Pacific wanted to abandon it, I think 1998, 1999, uh, because there wasn't a lot of traffic anymore. There were still a few shippers along the way, but Canadian Pacific was saying, we can't make money off this line anymore. And so they made an application as you had to do at the time, you had to apply to abandoned railway lines that you don't want to use. And uh, the Transport Canada said, well, uh, we won't let you abandon it, but we have a buyer. And uh, the town of Orangeville got together with the city of Brampton and the two municipalities bought that railway line between Streetsville Junction and Orangeville because they knew they had a few factories, they, uh, jobs in Orangeville, jobs in, in Brampton that might be lost if the railway line closed. So in September, 2000, uh, a new railway was farmed called the Orangeville Branton Railway, and the black and gray locomotives that you can see coming in the streets of Junction most days, uh, not part of Canadian Pacific. And uh, yeah, it's, an, it's one of the first independent railways in Canada that was a breakaway from the two big railways. Hmm. And yeah, so it's all owned, it's, it's owned by Branton and Orangeville, it's owned by the two municipalities. And, and this was the line that, uh, the, the northward line here that went to Orangeville, this is the line that had the famed uh, horseshoe wreck, right? Uh, this is the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yes and no. No, actually the the, uh, the horseshoe wreck yeah, was, was where they had to kind of go around this big hill in near Caledon, but that was the Toronto Grain Bruce. Okay. They're easily confused because they both became part of CP and where the TG&B and the Credit Valley met at Orangeville, then the... the yeah, the TGB line was the one that continued up to, to Owen Sound. So right. under CP, yeah, the two had kind of merged. But east of uh, of uh, of uh, Orangeville, in Peel County, I mean, in Caledon, uh, yeah, there was the Horseshoe Curve, which was a fairly sharp curve, and trains are going too fast. Trains have a tendency to tip to the side if they're going to. Same thing if you're riding a bike, you have a tendency to lean into the curve. Yeah. Cars do that on racetracks. And, uh, but if they go too fast, they can tilt too much and topple over. And this is what happened one day. I don't remember the year, 1913 or something. Yeah, I forget the year. Uh, 1907. 1907. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the engineer, I guess, was just going too fast, lost control, maybe putting too much steam. Yeah. I mean, back in the old days, the steam locomotives were hard to handle. And he took the, uh, took the curve too quickly and the train toppled over. Uh, and left a mess. Uh, the horseshoe curve isn't there anymore, but I remember you and I looking on Google earth yeah. one day you can still see uh, cool. where the right of way was because no railway lines are gone and and farmers don't do anything because uh, in this case it was embanked so a farmer bought the land later really couldn't farm around this embankment so the embankment is still there and you can yeah you can trail the scene kind of where's my finger going here <laughs> <laughs> and, and the uh, kind of made this odd curving uh, which is still there on the map 
so you're saying, you were mentioning that CP purchased the uh, the both the Credit Valley and the Toronto Gray and Bruce. The Toronto Gray and Bruce is no longer right. They lifted those tracks. Uh, yeah, they, they lifted those tracks early because the Credit Valley line through Street Store was better engineered. It was it was a standard gauge where the TGB originally was a cheaper built narrow gauge railway, okay. although it was standard gauge. It 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 was in business till 1931. And again, the Depression, same year as the Trunks Burton, I guess, uh, the Depression took that line out. But there wasn't a lot of traffic on that one section. But the, the TGB line to Orangeville continued, or rather, to Owen Sound. I think it was only closed about maybe 10 years ago. There's no trains to Owen Sound, no freight trains to Owen Sound. Uh, but that wasn't that long ago. The, the passenger service, uh, I got a photograph somewhere. I think it's, it's in the Heritage of Saga collection of the last passenger train to Owen Sound but people getting on at the Streetsville station, uh, October 30th, 1970. And that was the last passenger train to Streetsville until go train service started about 50 years later. Well, it's, I, I know I've heard it described as railway mania, but that, that period of the 1850s, uh, when you, uh, into the 1870s, where you get this, you know, this proliferation of, of many different railways throughout the province, all going on the, you know, higgly piggly across the landscape, mm -hmm. so to speak. That was the problem you, about them. Exactly. But then you get into this period of, of uh, conglomeration where they, they buy each other out and they amass, you know, uh, uh, right of ways into one, one ownership period. And then they begin to close railways and, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, gradually. And it's not, it's not a static process because it continues to this day where, you, you know, lines that get used versus lines that slowly get abandoned because, you know, businesses change and, and, and needs change. But, that those decisions remain on our landscape. They really define the physical landscape. You can see those railway decisions that were made uh, so many yeah. years ago. Yeah, a lot of old abandoned lines there. Yeah, have been gone almost 100 years. You can still see they're there. Yeah, too many railways were built early on. A lot of investors, that's it's kind of, you know, people is railways were a way to make money if they were good railways, if they had a purpose to them. But a lot of people... You know, once the, again, once you build a line from Montreal to Toronto, well, you know, the other railways that are left are going to be to smaller towns. They were never going to be financially feasible, but a lot of naive investors thought, hey, railways, a great way to make money, which they are if they're good railways. But so many people lost money. Um, uh, sometimes competition have, uh, again, I'm uh, talking about that shortcut between Buffalo and, and Detroit, but going through Southern Ontario, there were four or five railways that competed with each other. There's only enough traffic for one. They're all abandoned now. Uh, but yeah, all these small railways would eventually be bought up by either CN or CP. And then they pick the best pieces of the railway lines, uh, half of this railway, and match it up with half of another railway they purchased and abandon the two bad sections and keep the two good sections to create a route. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much how CN and CP got to be by taking over all these, oftentimes doubtful railway projects. <laughs> and even in some cases, uh, it hasn't happened in Mississauga yet, but it might. But it, in the 1990s, there were a lot of railways. Again, when CP wanted to bend the line to Orangeville, and they found a private investor to take over the line, which happened. There are cases uh, in Canada where CN and CP sold the lines. Uh, another company made them profitable again with, uh, you know, the, the lighter union regulations and things like that. And then the railway said, hey, now that this other company has made this line profitable, we'll buy it back again. <laughs> and so that's happened. Who knows, the Orangeville branch and railway might back, end up back in CP's hands. <laughs> profitable railway. Well, you know, Richard, uh, your wealth of knowledge, uh, you know, I, I've always relied on you for many years on, on anything that runs on rails. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, perhaps we can do a future episode. I'd love to explore some of the the you know, those, those, those finer point stories of some of the the early railway history. You know, the Credit Valley Railway is a fascinating one, and you know the third giant, if you will, and uh, you know mm -hmm. it, it, one of those ones with grand aspirations. It probably came along a little too late in the game uh, to to, yeah. to to profit. But uh, you know, well, there is an interesting story. We won't do it today because it would yeah. take too long. But there is a great story about the Credit Valley Railway and the Goodrum family. In yes, yes, and tragedy that took place literally on the day the uh, railway line opened. And so, a house that still survives. And the house is still there on, on yeah. Main Street. 
Mm-hmm. So definitely, we'll, we'll do that another time. And, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated. Uh, we, we've touched on the past of uh, uh, a, when the, when the, we didn't touch on it in this episode, but when the Great Western opened, which is a railway line that runs parallel to Lakeshore Road, mm-hmm. um, when it opened, there was a, a farmer in the Clarkson area that said uh, no. And, yeah. uh, uh, they were holding up for too much money. He knew the railways had the money. He thought he needs my land to get between uh, Hamilton and Toronto. So I'll hold up for what I can get. <laughs> so we'll explore that story on another episode. So yeah. R- Richard, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your, your, your knowledge and your passion for rail- railways with us here and uh, really appreciate your time. No, thanks for inviting me anytime. Wonderful. So thank you for uh, spending time with us here at Ask a Historian and for joining us each and every week. And keep sending in your questions and we'll continue to explore the stories of our city each week. And don't forget to like and subscribe and stay connected with us here at Heritage Mississauga. And if you have any questions that are uh, particular to railways, uh, send them on in and we'll have another episode with with Richard and we'll explore uh, things that run on rails in historic Mississauga because there's lots of stories to explore. And uh, uh, I always say one of them comes about as, uh, you know, people ask about the 1979 train derailment. They'll say, can you tell us about the train derailment? And I'll often respond with, uh, which one? Uh, Of course, there were more than one train accident, of course, most of us only recognize one for obvious reasons, but uh, there were there were multiple times when uh, when uh, when things uh, happened on on railways through mm-hmm. Mississauga. But just a fascinating story of this this chapter of our city that you know not just Mississauga's story. Uh, this happened throughout the province and uh, this this railway mania era and and Mississauga was in the midst of two major urban areas that were, were spreading outwards and uh, and we benefited with the arrival of railways and they helped define our landscape and a generation of people. So with that, thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian and we'll see you next week. Okay.